G'day ladies and gents and welcome back to Rise of Flight with Mags and welcome aboard the Felix Stowe F2A. The Felix Stowe is a British flying boat bomber that was developed in 1916 and introduced to service in 1917 and it served with the Royal Naval Air Services and the Royal Air Force during this time. The F2A variant was powered by two Rolls-Royce V12 Eagle engines at 345 horsepower each. It had a maximum speed of 154 kilometers an hour and a maximum altitude of 9,600 feet, or just over 2,900 meters. For a bomber of its time, it was actually really well defended. It was armed with four 7.7 millimeter Lewis guns, two on a dual rotating mount at the front of the aircraft, one in the dorsal section, again on a rotating mount sitting above the tail, and then a single gun that could be operated by a single gunner from inside of the tail section. Now the tail gun was interesting as the gun could be fired out of either the left or right hand side and had mounts for both. However, there was only enough room in the tail for a single weapon. So the gunner would need to shift the weapon from the left to the right hand side of the aircraft as was needed. That being said, that was standard armaments and it wasn't uncommon for F2As in service to have the operational crews have anywhere up to seven Lewis guns on the aircraft at any given time. And this was felt necessary by some air crews due to the extremely light construction necessary in a flying boat that could carry any form of heavy ordnance, along with its relatively slow maneuverability, making it a very vulnerable target to enemy fighters. Speaking of ordnance, the aircraft could carry up to 460 pounds or a little over 200 kilograms of bombs under the wings, the most common configuration being two 100 kilogram bombs. This may seem like very little by modern standards, but for the time, this was an extraordinary amount of explosive potential in a single aircraft. In this configuration, the Felix Stowe F2A could maintain flight time for up to six hours and easily had the range to patrol most of the English Channel. However, again, it wasn't uncommon for flight crews to attach additional bombs to the aircraft, most commonly in two additional 100 pound or approximately 50 kilogram bombs that would be mounted alongside of the 100 kilogram bombs already carried by the aircraft. And they would do this at the sacrifice of climb rate, airspeed, range, and endurance. So, what are we up to today in this particular flyout? Well, today we're going to engage in a little bit of anti-submarine warfare. The date is Friday, April 21st, 1918. Last night, a British destroyer encountered a German submarine operating in the area. It damaged a cargo ship and in turn was fired upon by the destroyer and the captain claims it was critically damaged. However, the destroyer captain had to pull off his pursuit of the submarine due to darkness falling. Early this morning, just before sunrise, a light cruiser operating in the area sent a message in code that they had encountered an enemy vessel, most likely the enemy submarine, trying to limp for home. It is now just after sunrise and we are departing Felixstowe. We are to head on course 115 until we encounter the light cruiser, at which point we are to begin patrolling the area and see if we can locate this hostile submarine. Mission orders are to sink it. So about 10 minutes into the flight, we have our first encounter of the mission. It's a British transport fleet escorted by a light cruiser. I'm unsure of the designation. Convoys like this at the time generally carried troops or supplies intended for the front and they're exactly the reason that submarines were operating in this area and the very reason that aircraft like this operated trying to defend them. The Kriegsmarine of course is more notably remembered for its U-boat campaigns during World War II but there was a reason why they were so dangerous straight from the get-go in World War II and that was because this wasn't the first time that the Kriegsmarine and its U-boats had fought this kind of a war. They had done this all the way through World War I. The tactics were already established. They were, of course, improved upon in World War II, but the basis was already there. This was exactly what they had been trained for and exactly what they had done in the past. So it was at this point I decided, let's go take a close look at these ships. Now, the Felix Stowe is actually a relatively easy aircraft to fly, and it flies particularly well. It's fairly stable, although it is very, very slow to maneuver, and it does take a lot of work to get anything out of its rudder. However, on the other side, the elevation controls are fantastic, being placed directly behind the engines to be in maximum airflow, providing the aircraft is moving above around 90 kilometers an hour. At slow speeds, elevation control gets a little sluggish as well. But the biggest thing to watch is when you're putting them in dives like this to dip down in between the ships, it accelerates surprisingly quickly, and once you start passing about 170 kilometers per hour in the aircraft, it runs the risk of tearing its own wings off. Which, of course, 
makes complete sense considering that the aircraft itself is really just a giant light wooden canvas wing with a boat slapped in the middle. That said, the dive itself is fairly easy to control. You've just got to button the engines back to just above idle. You don't want to go all the way to idle. That can cause the engines to stall, or at least I've had that happen before. And remember not to push forward too hard on the stick. If you put it in too steep a dive, you're going to wind up breaking it. Slow, smooth and elegant movements are really the key to flying this aircraft and providing you keep those stick movements nice and smooth, you're not too aggressive on the throttles, don't dive too hard, don't climb too steeply, uh, the aircraft really is just a dream to fly around. Anyways, that's our look at the fleet, let's press on. Just a couple of minutes later and we come across the handiwork of the U-boat from the night before. That is the transport ship that was attacked and torpedoed, still in the process of sinking. This was not entirely uncommon during World War I. Torpedoes were notoriously unreliable, and when they did detonate, while the damage was usually more than enough to sink a ship, with obviously the massive blast in the hull of the vessel, and commonly torpedoes could also ignite the cold stores and even cause the detonation of the boilers on a ship, it was very rarely powerful enough to completely destroy the vessel for rapid sinking. While initial casualties in such attacks were always high, survivors were not uncommon, providing vessels got close enough to rescue the people that managed to survive the attack fast enough. However, rapid response and rescue wasn't always possible due to the immediate danger posed by the U-boats, and most survivors were rescued during the warmer months, with the colder months significantly reducing the time that people would survive in the water, which coupled with the often slow response time due to the danger of the U-boats, often led to a significantly higher number of casualties due to exposure and the cold. Thankfully we don't need to dwell on that for too long, not long after flying over the wreck we encounter the light cruiser that is patrolling the area looking for the submarine at the moment, the one that radioed in the message that they had encountered a hostile in the area. You can see the cruiser searching the surrounding waters at the moment with its floodlight looking for signs of the U-boat. Now this was common practice through pretty much all of World War I and World War II as a means of detection, however single boats hunting this way were not particularly reliable. The searching ship needed to be incredibly close to the U-boat in order to be able to detect it, with the most common U-boat available at this particular time period in the war being the Type 93 U-boat, which was only 71 metres long in total length from bow to stern, however in standard cruising configuration would have as little as 10 metres of its hull actually exposed to the surface. The Koning Tower on this particular class of submarine was only 3 metres tall as well, so it didn't have to travel too far away from a searching ship to be virtually undetectable amongst the waves. Which is precisely why naval patrol aircraft were put into usage in the first place. Flying from a higher altitude obviously gives you a better view and gives you a better down view on the waves. Now, when you are scanning for a submarine, due to this small size of exposed area, pilots and searchers and spotters would very rarely look for the submarine itself. It was often very difficult to detect amongst the waves. The easiest way to detect the submarine was to look for its wake Initially around the submarine as it's travelling through the water it will generate a large wake several times the size of the exposed surface area of the ship and it's white so it stands out quite strongly against the waves. Further than that, usually for a length up to a kilometre behind a vessel, especially a vessel moving at high speed, the churned water would turn a lighter colour, a more green colour, that while almost undetectable from a surface ship perspective was very easily spottable from the air. So just a couple of minutes after entering the search zone, we were joined by a second F-2A that has pulled into formation. It carries no bombs to speak of, but two aircraft in formation is always better than one. And we began our search. It took around about 15 minutes to locate the submarine running an S search pattern through the area that was designated. As you can see just off to the left hand side, the white wake generated by the U-boat while it's on the surface is quite visible, but the U-boat itself is actually rather hard to spot amongst it. And at this point after detection, the wake of the U-boat continues to work against it, as the wake itself draws a direct line showing the direction of travel of the U-boat, allowing the pilot to line up the bomber for an accurate attack, which is exactly what I'm doing now. At the time, pilots that were experienced in U-boat hunting could also often tell by the length of the wake approximately how fast the U-boat was actually moving across the surface, and could calculate their bomb drop based on this information. 
Now, while I was flying my search pattern, I took the time to pre-configure my bomb site for the attack once I managed to find the submarine. So at the moment, the bomb site is calibrated to drop from 300 meters at an air speed of 135 kilometers per hour. And the mission briefing also indicated that the weather today had a wind blowing from the west at three kilometers per hour, which I've also pre-programmed the bomb site for. So with the bomb site calibrated for the drop, all I need to do is line up directly on the wake at exactly 300 meters at 135 kilometers per hour and release as the target crosses the reticle. And you can see the submarine just crossing from the right towards the nose. The wake is actually harder to see from the rear than it is from the side. And we're now centered up and ready to jump into the bomb site. Now it's worth noting the explosives dropped by the aircraft in this time period were often not navalized. They were general purpose high explosive bombs, identical to what would be used in general ground bombing. And while a 100 kilo bomb was not considered a small bomb by any means, a water detonation, unless it was almost on top of the submarine, would often do very little damage, shake up the crew, but wouldn't cause a catastrophic hull failure. So as a general rule, taking out a submarine with a bomber required a direct hit to the hull. And at this point we're lined up for the release and bombs away. And the bomb release was almost perfectly on target. The slight off-center to the left was because the submarine is in the process of a right-hand turn, trying to avoid the bombs. However, it fell slightly too far to the stern. As I was saying, the explosive yield of these bombs is small enough that the submarine doesn't have to travel too far from the explosion to be virtually immune to any damage or shockwave from the blast. Unfortunately, the Phoenix Star only carries two bombs, as I said earlier on in the video, so I only get two cracks at this submarine. If I miss with the second bomb, that's it. While the aircraft is covered in Vickers machine guns, the hull of the submarine is metal and the 7.7s simply don't have the penetration to get through it. I can land the Felix Stowe right next to the submarine and pelt it till I was out of ammunition and I will achieve absolutely nothing. I need to hit it with this second bomb. Thankfully seeing where the first one dropped and knowing where I released in relation to the bomb site, I'm going to make another pass. Come around wide, line back up on the wake again, and then we can see the second F2A in formation. When I line up on this drop, I'm actually going to release a second and a half later, so the bomb is dropping slightly ahead. With luck, the submarine should turn into the explosion, and the explosion itself should be close enough to cause a catastrophic hull failure. It was actually quite difficult to keep a track of the submarine during these turns. As you can see, the Felix Stowe doesn't have the best downward visibility from inside of the cockpit. In real life, the pilot would be mostly guided by his gunners, in particular his forward gunner, who sits right in the very tip of the nose and has virtually no obstruction of his ground view, even under the wings is completely visible from his position, with his only real vision limitation being caused by the fuselage of the aircraft itself. So once again we line up in the wake of the submarine and it is attempting a right turn again and this time I'm going a little nose down, I'm going to dive bomb the bomb slightly to give it a little bit more oomph to the target. And there we go, bomb released. Target eliminated. Now at this point I put the aircraft into a left hand bank intending to circle the area and actually do some recording of the debris on the surface. Unfortunately, rise of flight doesn't seem to render much when it comes to the submarines. As you can see, there's an explosion, a few seconds of smoke, and within five to six seconds, the position of the submarine itself is virtually gone, and within 10 seconds, the wake itself is gone as well, leaving no sign or trace on the surface that there was ever a submarine there. In real life, of course, the diesel fuel and the oil from the engines would float to the surface, creating a rather large slick at the point of detonation, and any light materials ranging from paper to light woods would float out of the split open hull, creating a small but very visible debris field. Interestingly, survivors of destroyed U-boats regularly wouldn't come to the surface straight away. They would be unable to get themselves out of the rapidly flooding U-boat until some parts of the U-boat had equalized in pressure, allowing them to open hatches or even escape directly through the split open hull. There was some primitive breathing equipment at the time consisting of an air bladder that was sometimes used, but the truth is for the most part when the submarine was destroyed it was often lost with all hands. So from this point on the submarine has been destroyed and that is our sole objective for this mission. So at this point we turn our nose back to the west and return home.
The return to Port Felixstowe took around 40 minutes overall. Yes, the port is Felixstowe, as is the aircraft. And we come in making a straight pass over the harbour just to make sure the area is clear before we descend for landing. Now landing the Felixstowe is actually pretty straightforward overall. As I said earlier in the video, the aircraft starts losing elevation authority at around 90 kilometers per hour, but you don't want to touch down at any higher than around 60, otherwise you run the risk of driving the nose into the water. However, you can't drop your airspeed below about 70, as at that point the aircraft's nose will start to dip and you have incredibly low elevation authority at that point and will struggle to lift the nose up. The idea being to touch down with the hull relatively flat in comparison to the water. And I did notice on the flyover the seaplane docks, it does appear that at least one of the Felix doses backed itself right in underneath one of the docks. So, you don't need a particularly large area to land. Once you're on the water, the drag caused by the water tends to slow the aircraft up in a real hurry. But still, I like to take a little bit of extra space when flying this aircraft. Now, once you've got the aircraft on the water, it's actually relatively easy to taxi it into the seaplane docks. The aircraft itself has no keel, so it will tend to drift left and right, and it's important to remember that all of its propulsion and turning capability is on the rudder and the engines that you use in flight. There's nothing in the hull to assist with the turn. Still, the aircraft's quite capable of taxiing on the water at between 10 to 20 kilometers per hour without too much in the way of problems. Now, we're running a long right-hand bank to line up to the seaplane docks. This gives us a relatively straight shot into the mouth as we taxi up. As I said, I'm giving it quite a lot of area. It's far more than I actually need to land it down, but it gives us a good vision to make sure there is nothing in the water, no boats or anything that we could potentially hit, anything that we missed on our initial flyover. Engine's back to around 10% at this point, with about half stick back to keep the nose up and keep the hull nice and level during the descent. I actually started descending slightly too fast here for my liking. You can see the aircraft starting to nose forward, at which point I start throttling the aircraft back up just to maintain airspeed for a smooth approach. There you go, throttles up. We're at about 30% throttle at this point. So let's get a little bit closer and then once I've got the nose slightly elevated, throttle back to zero and just let the aircraft lazily drift in. Now the only thing you need to remember when you're touching down at this point is to keep the wings off at least for the first few seconds after touchdown. The aircraft will decelerate rapidly on the water due to that drag, but you don't want the wings to go straight into the water on touchdown. The sudden drag to one side of the aircraft could cause the aircraft to turn, and as a result it could tear the entire lower wing from the seaplane, and the floats on the wings are required to maintain stability as the aircraft bobs back and forth. If one of them is gone, the aircraft will tip over. So with the landing complete, we just let it drift for a moment and watch our second aircraft come in for touchdown. I have always liked watching seaplanes land. They're kind of beautiful in a way. The Felix Stowe with all of its exposed wood is actually a very attractive aircraft in my opinion. And it's convertible too, which is just a massive added bonus in my opinion. Anyways, from this point on, with both planes down, all that's left to do is give it a bit of right rudder to turn us back towards the dock, throttle up the engines, and begin to make our way back over to the parking area. Anyways, ladies and gents, I hope you enjoyed the video, and thank you very much for watching. I hope you liked a little bit of the historical talk as well. Please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section down below, and remember to click the like if you do. Hit the button on the screen now to subscribe if you want to see more. And as always, fly smart, fly safe, and I will catch you in the skies.